Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. Hi folks, I'm Dominic Kent. I'm a freelance marketing consultant for Hire. I'm currently working as the Director of Content Marketing and Communications at Mio, who are a B2B SaaS startup in Austin, although we're all working from from home at the moment. Uh, Our product currently ties together the messaging experience between apps like Slack, Microsoft Teams and WebEx Teams, so very much at the heart of everything that's going on in the digital workspace at the moment. Great. Well, thanks for giving us some of your time and joining us on, on the podcast. Uh, looking through your profile, you, you started off working for a company called 5G Communications. And I was curious to know if that was uh, 5G was is, was tied to actual the sort of new signal version that's coming out now or, or some other 5G iteration. Yeah, good, good question. And one that I think people don't ask me enough when they realize I worked for someone called 5G because it actually had nothing to do with 5G mobile communications whatsoever. Um, they were originally called Universal Telecom and they were literally 10 meters down the road from me. Um, I didn't know they were there. And one, one night they called me on a recruitment evening where people from outside the recruitment team literally phoned around people in the local area who had their CV on a on a job site and asked if you're interested in coming in for an interview for a telecoms company, of which at the time I didn't know what they did, didn't know who they were, even though they were literally just down the road. Turns out they were a telecoms provider, so providing things like uh, your basic phone line that you'd have in your home, business telephone lines like ISDN and things like that, as well as on-premises telephone systems and a little bit of VoIP telephony, so making calls over the internet at the most basic level. So I, I, start, I started there literally the day after my interview, and uh, that that kind of helped me skip the step of going to university, which I'd applied to. But I thought getting a job the very next day seemed like a a, a good a good decision to make. And then I'd maybe take a year round and go to university if I wanted to. But uh, I then stayed there for about four and a half years, and over those four and a half years, it changed from your basic telephone lines to more complex telephone systems and a, a little bit of uh, a little bit more digital things like instant messaging came into the telephony world and the rest is history i guess um i was just thinking that the i mean the irony of all this is we rely on on connectivity uh so much now i mean it's part of it's probably part of our maslow's uh, it's a maslow a hierarchy of needs mm-hmm. uh in order to do our jobs uh, specifically, I think Dom, you you based down in in Cornwall, uh, and as you said, you're t- most of your teams in the US, so you only have really connectivity as a way of interacting, unless you're flying out to the US or vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting you mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There was a a an amended version that I saw years ago, actually, um, and the the bottom two tiers included battery and then Wi-Fi, and then Maslow's hierarchy of needs began, uh, which which I thought was quite, I thought was quite funny. <laughs> I hadn't thought about battery. <laughs> no battery, sense. no battery, then the Wi-Fi doesn't, uh, yeah, doesn't, exactly. doesn't make any difference, does it? Although thinking, thinking about it, in the world, in the business world, and even in the consumer world, really, there's nothing that I'm going to do. Maybe I'm a unique case because I might be able to draft something on a Word document and then not upload it until I get into a Wi-Fi zone or get connected wherever. But there's there's nothing other than that, really, that I'm going to use my device, whatever it is, laptop, mobile, tablet. There's nothing I'm going to use that isn't connected, I don't think. So the, the reliance on connectivity is, is 100% there. No, it's true. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, with this pandemic, we're all spending a lot of time working from home so you don't really ever feel like you you leaving the office because it's really either either you're in the same room just doing uh, something different during the day or you 
as one guy was saying, he gets out of bed, has a shower, gets dressed, and he walks to his spare room and he sits down at his desk the whole day. That's so me, yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's, <laughs> there's not much of a gap. Um, but it, without that connectivity, you wouldn't be anywhere. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of jobs that have, that have obviously gone away because people can't work um, or they have been told not to go to work because of that, uh, um, I say more manual, but it, it makes it sound really simple. Um, it's front, yeah. frontline work, isn't it? And yeah. there's, there's a huge difference between the knowledge worker and the frontline worker, although the, the gap in technology, I think, is closing through mm. people like uh, Microsoft with their teams offering for first line workers and workplace do workplace by Facebook specifically have a, uh, I think a license for that, which, which is what they need. It's not logging in and having all of this crazy feature set that they're never going to use. It's a much, much more simplified stripped back version so that they can interact with everyone in their business that they need to do without being completely overwhelmed by, by what it is that they use. But coming back to your point on connectivity, those those frontline workers that are uh, maybe working in a, a large warehouse which is segmented by by metal walls or something like that they can't actually log into that app anyway because mm. it's so far away from their wi-fi point or there's no mobile reception in in the building they're working in so whilst the 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 app might be ready if you can't get access to the app that's that's rendered useless anyway no, 100%. And I'm just thinking, you know, for a person that's packing shelves or packing boxes and stuff like that. Um, I mean, even even walking around Sainsbury's yesterday, I, I noticed this for the first time. When they're packing the 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 stuff on the shelves, they're actually now taking pictures at the end, mm-hmm. which I hadn't noticed them doing before. And I'm wondering if that's not part of some enhanced process now, um, maybe because of, of the volumes of food that's been, been bought by shoppers, you know, hoarding. Um, to almost prove that they're del- that they're actually putting the stuff on the shelves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there, there's there's lo- they're likely using a kind of like a, a personal device like a Zebra or an Android that mm-hmm. you can you upload straight onto your stock system or whatever it is just to prove that they've actually put it in the right place so that it's not not in a position where people are going to have to scramble for it and therefore spread germs at, at the moment, but. There's also the element of just proving you've done your job, which I think is a big part of what those kind of devices actually come into play for. You've got less people in a supervisory role that have to come around and say, actually, you did put it in the right place or you've put it on the wrong shelf. Therefore, it's not not in the eye line of the person in the shop. And that's what the brand has paid for. They've paid for like the premium shelf dead center at the front mm. of the aisle or something like that. There's less of that because you can just upload it very quickly. Some kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence in the background recognizes that that is in the, the right place for that particular brand. And that yeah. saves the supervisor walking around the shop and doing all that manual work that doesn't need to exist if the technology can do it. Yeah. You remind me, we did some Salesforce automation years ago. And one of the, one of the steps in the process was that the, uh, sales rep, this was liquor and, and pharmaceutical, had to take a photo of the building before they entered it. And you and you take the GPS coordinates and you would take the image, uh, and this is before machine learning became mainstream, uh, and confirm that they were within X amount of meters from the, the designated address. And that was to prove they were visiting the, the building, um, which was fine if they were doing a you know, taking an order from a customer and the customer needed to do face to face to face. Um, ironically, the, the one company fired their top sales guy because he never left the golf course. Um, and he was using old photos and they picked it up, but he was playing golf with his customers. Um, and that's how he was doing his orders because they got out the office and, and he got time on the, with them and did the deal. And he was doing all the orders through the system anyway. But uh, they had this process that had to be followed about taking a photo at the building on the day. On That's the crazy, isn't it? If you're if you're hitting yeah. your sales targets, your sales quota through through what, whatever means, as long as you're not breaking a law or doing something unlawful, then I've I've always been uh, a, a fan of get your work done, whatever means necessary. To the point mm. where when I started working remotely on my own accord, it was definitely still frowned upon that you weren't in the office. But then all of a sudden, the PowerPoint I was working on or the 
the sale the sales deck the whatever it is the rfp it would be complete and i would send it across it would come as a surprise to everybody that i had been working while i wasn't in the office and even though i've worked in all these comms companies that was not the mentality until probably only a couple of years ago if i'm honest it, it's such a big shift for uh, i was telling my boss about it uh, this a couple of weeks ago because because he he and i had this have had this conflict since i started about working from home well not, and, and i'm not a big one for working from home either i think there's days where you should and there's days when you shouldn't um but being in the office five days a week i think that's a that's a factory mindset um and if you're not at your desk you're not working there's also a factory mindset um and he he sort of intimated that he's finally seen that you can work from home productively provided you set up for it i think you know sitting at home at your dining room table um we we eat dinner and lunch is, is not a good place to do your work either because i think that confuses your your spaces um but if you've got the desk and that setup you can do it but but that whole mindset that he that he sort of picked on that that you got to trust people to deliver things and if you're not seeing them it doesn't mean they're not working and and they might be working you know 2 a.m to 6 6 a.m because that's that's when they they work the best um and the tooling now exists in this in this wonderful world of technology we have that you can work anytime anywhere um and on any device throw the whole slogan in there um but as long as that document arrives or, or that piece of material comes out um you know it, it suitably uh, quite suitable quality at a suitable amount of time um, you can trust people to do stuff uh, on a results basis as opposed to are you at your desk nine to six, um, which is what some old school mentalities will have is that you're not you're going to be at your desk nine to six, five days a week. And whether you play in solitaire or you, or you at your, as long as you're at your desk, I'm sort of more comfortable. Yeah, there's a lot of um, the, 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 it, it was considered taboo to to work remotely when i first started working remotely um and i think as now everyone has been as everyone's now been forced to work from home it's not quite the same as planning for it preparing for it so you've got a lot of people juggling their kids as well as their their work-life balance so that's that's a work life slash parent uh balance which is completely different to planned working from home there's mm. you, you mentioned you shouldn't sit at your dining table and work for the day. I think that's fine if you have the discipline to switch off yourself. I don't mm. think there's a right way or wrong way to work remotely. So all of the thousands of blogs that all of the providers in my industry have written, I would say 95% of those are redundant, probably written by people that have never worked from home before. Maybe I'm being a bit skeptical, but <laughs> from what I've read of those thousands, there, there aren't any that have offered me any good advice as someone that has worked from home for years. Um, my girlfriend, for example, she works from the dining room table and she switches off as soon as she finishes her hours for the day or the project she's working for. And she certainly doesn't struggle from not having that work-life balance. Personally, I I work in a different area every time I start a different piece of work for a new client. <clears throat> so if I'm, if I'm working on something for Mio, I'll do it in my spare bedroom slash office if i'm doing uh, a guest blog just for myself that i'm posting somewhere else i might go to a coffee shop obviously mm. I can't do at the moment but if, <laughs> I'm, if i'm then working for another client on another day i'll go and work in maybe the dining room or maybe go and work outside i have that that option as well right so as long as i segment what i'm doing in either work slash life or customer by customer i think that works perfectly for me so, so what you've just said now is exactly what I was trying to imply, is that if you have spaces for certain things, then that's that's a much better way of doing it. I mean, if your girlfriend can get away with it, that's great. I, I know I, I could when I was younger, but now that I'm older, I'm a little more, routine, more habit, habitual. Um, but I used to love writing freeform stuff in a coffee shop. Yeah. Whereas if I'm doing research, then I need to be at my desk with, with all my stuff laid out and... Um, you know, almost building up the piles of knowledge as I investigate things, print things out, circle things, etc. So it depends on what you're doing. I definitely think that's that's, that's uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the the kind of a, the asynchronous way of working you mentioned as well, being able to do stuff whenever you want, is is very beneficial for me. I I know that I'm most productive first thing in the morning, so I typically start at half seven every morning. I will then go and work in my garden if the weather is nice enough because I know that 
that combination of working outside and being early in the morning is when I'm most productive. That by that that serves me quite well because everyone in our Austin office is asleep at that time. So by the time that I've reach the peak of my productivity, I can then come inside again and do all the collaborative work that actually needs the the better bandwidth that exists in my house rather than outside my house. The Wi-Fi is not quite as strong if I sit in my garden compared to when I'm sat next to the router in my office. So it sounds like it sounds like you've been working from home for a few years. So you've gone, you've undergone that shift from, you know, not really having, you know, just having email, um, you know, maybe you know, some, you know, Microsoft Skype, something like that to, you know, this new world of there's a million collaboration tools that you can choose from. Um, how has that kind of changed your your style of work from home um, over the years? It's made it, uh, I, I've never found it hard to work from home. When I, when I started working from home, it was, um, the, the option wasn't really there, but we discussed it a little bit and it was, uh, more because I wanted to do it more because we just got a dog. Um, so rather than paying for someone to come walk it every day, I thought, Hey, why not try working from home one or two days a week? Asked my boss who said, yes, let's give it a go. That's fine. But in a company of about 400 people, nobody else was doing it. So people assumed that I was either really ill or something happened on a Monday and a Tuesday or whenever it was, I worked from home and they didn't expect me to, to do anything even though I was working for a company that did these kind of messenger tools that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, it, I think it only became apparent maybe six months into when I've been working from home two days a week that actually I was working from home rather than just being at home. Um, and that was because the tools that we were working with were evolving all the time. We were, we were working with uh, Broadsoft UC1, which isn't a particularly well-known messenger client. Uh, Cisco has since bought Broadsoft and, and everybody knows about WebEx. But I think as they were used in the office more, people then started to realize, hey, Dom is online because there's a green light next to his name. And if I message him, he will respond. People then realized that actually, okay, he is working from home. He's not just off sick at home or whatever it might have been. And, and as that sort of technology stack got better and you could do more, and as I moved to a different company with even more employees, when I was at Maersk, I think there's 80,000 employees at Maersk across 200 or so offices, it became apparent that the companies that adopted those technologies were more productive to work in because everybody was in a different office anyway. So it didn't really matter where I was. I didn't have anyone else in my team in the maiden head office I was working in. Everyone was in London and I was dealing with projects that were global. So the three days a week I would go into the office there in the Maidenhead office, there was no one in my team anyway. So it was, I would go in and sit at a different hot desk every day, uh, meet, meet someone new every day, which was great, but they were in a security team or, or something more to do with shipping because it was a shipping company, nothing to do with what I was doing, which was rolling out phone systems and, and Microsoft link at the time. And that kind of carried on throughout the next couple of companies I worked at as technology evolved and you could do more and it was more obvious that you were working not just absent that uh, it became a lot easier I think yeah it's funny that you mentioned you know going to into a physical office space because you know you have to but then there's really no one there that you need to talk to because that's that's kind of my experience um, most days um, in terms of you know the the way that I work hasn't really changed we do um, my company uses Microsoft Teams primarily and, um, you know, of course, I use a few other tools as well. But, um, you know, I, I work in our R&D office, so it's all of our engineers, but um, I'm a product marketer. So, you know, most of the time, you know, besides talking to people around, you know, the water cooler, um, there's no reason for me to to necessarily be there physically because all the, you know, the marketers are kind of spread out across the globe. Mm, yeah. And I, I think that was that was something that became uh, most obvious when I was at Maersk because nobody had a set desk either. Hot desking was deemed to be the, uh, I don't know if it was the most productive, but certainly the most fashionable way to be working then. This is only five years ago. You, you, would, you would go in and the desk you were sat at yesterday would be taken unless you were there at 7am, uh, which 
it isn't a problem if you're there 7 a.m. every day and you want the same desk. But it was good that you couldn't leave anything on the desk. So you walked in every morning and everything was tidy and you went and you plugged your laptop into the, the dock that was there and everything was all nice and clean. And we had these really expensive desks that went up and down, but didn't really matter because you weren't going to be there for more than one day. So I learned a lot about not needing to be in the office there, I think, because after a while I realized that those three days I was contracted to be in the office nobody was taking note because they weren't there themselves anyway my my line manager was in the London office so I took it upon myself to come in when I needed to which was extremely infrequently um and save myself the petrol every day gained a couple more hours in which I could do some work it, you made me think of it um I mean when I when I moved to the UK um it was the first time I actually had to be in the office every day. Um, all my career before that, it was it was working, either you worked from home um, to go, and then you went to go see customers uh, or you um, went to the office to go and do sort of, you know, like a team day or an admin, mm-hmm. you know, admin day or whatever. So, so very much consulting mentality where on Fridays you're in the office because you have to do all your expense claims and see your boss and, and all that kind of stuff. It was only when I came here that I realized that it was, became such a big deal to be in the office. But that whole hot desking fad, if you like, which I suppose is not really fad, um, had just started to take off. And we were then looking at ratios of people to a desk. So you're looking at two people or three people to share a desk. And mm-hmm. the funny thing that I sort of recollected was back in South Africa, if someone parked in your parking space, people got quite upset about that. <laughs> and, and desks became the same sort of thing. Because if you had someone that was getting to the office every day early and, and getting that desk, you know, if it was two, if it was two weeks of doing the same thing, there was like a, 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 an ownership of that desk. And then if they had to do a trip somewhere and come back and someone else had now got into the routine of sitting at that desk, it was quite funny to watch how people got upset about it. I mean, the desk was just, the desk, there was no storage or anything like that. It was a, it was a chair and a table. Um, with the docking station, which was ubiquitous across the whole organization. There was there was none that was better or worse. But these people got, you know, the amount of support calls we used to get because they were trying to move the um, the docking station or the screen um, from one desk to another desk because that was their docking station and it was they've been using it for for weeks and now they now use a new desk and they need this they need the setup. It was it was hilarious. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? There's um, there, there's two things I'd like to unpack from what you just said. The the first one you mentioned coming from a consultancy background before you're in the UK. The I think the this is probably the same for 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 law firms. I think as well. You if you're a consultant, you're either doing some research or you're physically with a client or you're preparing the output of your client visit and that research. But I think if you, if you shrink it right down, that's what you're doing. And none of those need to be in the office. So when I first became a consultant, my, uh, when I was offered the job in an interview, the assumption was I would work from home because I lived so far away from the office and I would go and see clients as and when I needed to. And Joel, who I interviewed with said those exact words, at which point, I knew that I was going to say yes to this job offer because they just got it. And at that time, I'd only ever worked in service providers and in the telecoms world who should have been the people that said, I assume you're just going to work from home and then go and see clients when you need to. It wasn't until Joel literally said those words as he was offering me a job that I went, okay, maybe this is the kind of business I should be in that actually gets it. They are using the technology, but also they realize I don't need to be in the office 24 seven. So that was, that was really refreshing. And I think that's a reflection on the consultancy industry. The second thing I wanted to unpack was the kind of free for all mentality. You said, um, I would extend that to, uh, not just designated car parking spaces and hot desks, but at, at Musk, the company was so big, it didn't fit in the office car park. We would have the entire, <laughs> I think it was pretty much the entire Sainsbury's car park as well. And that was a free for all as well. If you were, if you were in past half past eight, you probably wouldn't get a space in our extended car park. And then you'd have to go and find uh, a parking space on a side road, which then obviously had a knock on effect of annoying everybody that was supposed to park there because they lived there. So there's, there's all these knock on effects, aren't there, of that kind of free for all mentality if you don't scale it. Mm. 
that's funny because the, the company I work for, we had a customer once um, use our software to, you know, they observed the concurrency of different users when they came into the office um, mm-hmm. and they built their parking lot um, accordingly so they could, you know, respond to the peak demand um, with parking spots. That's that's the most sensible suggestion I've ever heard of that kind of thing. <laughs> In in the in the uh, call center and customer service world, which I was to, where I spent a lot of my consultancy time, there's a lot of workforce optimization that goes on. And how many customer service reps do we need to answer the amount of calls? Do we need everyone in the same office? Does it need to be regional? Does it need to be uh, maybe just one in the north, one in the south, or or by skill set or whatever it is? And nobody ever gets it right, especially when they if they change a product or they introduce a, a premium support line or something like that. And I think even with the technology that they've got in place there, it lacks a bit of common sense, which sounds like what, uh, what happened in your example. Definitely. I do want to get into, you know, unified communications a little bit too, if we want to um, <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> where, where, where do you want, where do you want to start? Um, That's a great at, question. At, at the beginning, probably. <laughs> Sure. What is the beginning to you? Uh, I, I don't know. I've been trying to find that out in my own podcast, really. <laughs> I've been asking everyone to walk through their career in Unified Com so that if I could see a, a common starting point, my conclusion so far is there isn't one. People come from IT. They come from retail, business backgrounds. People have started off in something completely different to telecoms altogether. Uh, one chap I had on called Graham, he works, he's the UC director for Crestron, who are a leading supplier of devices for Unified Comp, so lots of webcams and headphones and headsets and things like that, uh, meeting room systems. He wanted to be a, a racing car driver. Um, <laughs> and I think that the, the long and short of his story was he or maybe not a racing car driver, but a mechanic or something involved in that. But he took a a different job because it was closer to his house and ended up in Unified Comms, which is very similar to my story. Um, So people don't get into Unified Comms for any specific reason, I don't think. I I liked the technology after maybe four or five years when it became Unified Comms in my mind, but the term had been around a lot longer than that, that's for sure. I think what unified comms actually isn't where it began in my personal experience is probably when messaging started to integrate with telephony Mm. which might be completely different to your guys opinion i think Mm. if you define unified comms of which i've been asking everyone on my podcast for their definition everyone's is different so there's no right or wrong answer My definition would be something like, my definition would be about a thousand words long, but it'd be something like (laughs) combining everything together, every method of communication, be it calling, meetings, chat, everything in between and everything that plugs into it. Combining it all together in, in one place or not necessarily one place, but one, one preference where you can connect to everything else, which is a terrible but that's that's why it's so big and finding the actual and, and i think know. it and i think it was you saying that on one of your episodes that that got me to sort of connect you and say we should chat about this because that's that's pretty much how i see well, i'm not sure heather thinks but how a digital workspace is and it's not, and it's everything including unified comms in one place um in context so using the right tools at the right time to do the thing you need to do enable by technology and whatever that technology is. Um, and just to carry that forward into, into the UC space, what I always saw that as is that the, you know, you're going to want to communicate with somebody, but how you communicate shouldn't be so specific that you have to pick a certain product or type to do it. So, for example, if I phone somebody uh, back in the days of, of mobile phones rolling out, you only have one phone number. Whether that phone number took you to your desk phone or took you to your uh, mobile phone or to your soft phone, um, it didn't matter to to the caller because as far as as long as they got hold of the person, that's all they worried about and that's all they needed. And that's where unified comms really started for me. Whenever that was, and that was back oof, back in two thousand and two, I think. 
back when Link was still being rolled out or communication mm-hmm. server. Um, it's interesting you mentioned kind of tying UC into the digital workspace because they're both both so broad terms, aren't they? And mm. You mentioned the having one phone number. Personally, I I don't think I need my phone number. If someone has dialed my, I don't I don't have a landline number, be it UK or US. So nobody can phone me on my business number. But then, one, I wouldn't answer anyway, and two. It would, I guess, it would be a surprise if somebody did phone me on on a business number. All of my work is done via either uh, messaging, a bit of email, which I'm going to try and eradicate in May. I'm going to do a little experiment <laughs> where I don't respond to any emails and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and even in my personal life, I think if someone phones me, I assume there's a real emergency. Someone's probably in in hospital or my girlfriend's locked herself out or something like that everything happens over whatsapp or in a twitter so, dm so would you consider the a whatsapp call as as a as a call or would you call that just another form of instant messaging i would i would call that a call but i don't use whatsapp calling okay. L- literally i i only have a call with someone on a scheduled basis and that's uh, I, I'm, I'm lucky because I can work, or well, I have to work asynchronously, asynchronously. Of my mm. eight or nine hours in the working day, the rest of the Mio team are only there, f- are only around for maybe two and a half hours of those. So we schedule a call mm. so that it doesn't disappear. Um, that's that's how I worked previously in a in a consultancy when I wasn't in the office either. People would schedule a call because they wanted your time, or you would schedule a call because. Well, the same reason you you wanted their time, so you would schedule. There was very little ad hoc calls that are required, and I think that's because it's been replaced by the messaging element, which I guess the persistent messaging element, rather than instant messaging. You don't have to reply immediately because your message will still be there the next mm. day. The context will still be there because you can see it all in a thread, and you can have uploaded a file and put an image on it or something, and you can have done a slash remind command so that it pops up so that you don't lose it forever. And I think for me, that's why I don't need to call anyone anymore. Yeah, I think what you're describing is definitely the way of the future. It's funny because, you know, I actually had to go and request um, a work number. And it's not because I, um, you know, enjoy, you know, calling people that way. It's because I work, you know, pretty cross-functionally and I work with the vendors and I work with people outside of the organization. And um, it was interesting when I was researching Mia, I was like, oh yeah, I have this problem. I'm sure a lot of people have this problem. You know, I was reading your, your workplace um, study where it says, you know, the average person uses three kind of chat, you know, communication apps, um, you know, in their work day. And that's definitely me. Um, But I think, you know, it is like the lack of interoperability that makes, you know, calling a number still like the simplicity of it that, you know, anyone can um, dial you that way is still, um, you know, it's still a necessity for some people. Yeah, definitely. I think that the report you referenced was actually for internal use. Um, So that's that it's 3.3 is the average Mm. amount of apps you have to chat internally. Okay. So there's then the what if you need to talk to someone externally and in the, in the world of messaging and chat, which is what it was about, the answer is, well, there's probably going to be another one because the chances of you using the same app as me are, are pretty slim because there are so many different choices of apps out there. I mean, I've got, I don't know, six, seven mm. myself, but that's because I'm in the industry and it's, in my best interest to have all of these and to know how they work. Also, Mio does the job of syncing them all together, right? So I need to have them all together for testing purposes and taking screenshots for blog posts and things like that. But even before that, when I was a consultant, I had a couple to chat internally. The 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 tool of choice at Stable Logic was Microsoft Teams, but I preferred to use Slack because I was used to the the user interface one or two other people used slack so we were using two internally we were still using skype for business as well because we hadn't fully transitioned to teams so that's three ways to instant message someone and then when i needed to talk to somebody else in the in the client world 
I was either logging on as a guest user in Microsoft Teams, which is another Teams instance, so that's that's four already, and then whatever else all my other clients were using, and I'd normally have four or five at one time, so I could be using something by eight by eight or Ring Central. So I've got all of those for external use. I also had to maintain a relationship with all those suppliers in case I had to introduce one to a procurement or something like that. So I was constantly using their tools to talk to them. So my laptop would be full of 15, 20 isn't an exaggeration. All those apps just to talk to different people. And okay, I'm in the industry, but if you think about that relationship of vendor supplier, as well as customer, as well as internal, that's, that's a lot of apps to juggle. And while, while they all exist for messaging, they also all exist for calling and for meetings. Um, and for me personally, if you added in a direct phone number to reach me on as well, that would be uh, over communication, shall we say? <laughs> it is overwhelming for sure. Um, and I think you hit on something there that, you know, you mentioned a preference for Slack. I think for a lot of us, you know, the tool that we, the first one we use, the one that we get really familiar with, we build all of our workflows in becomes a preference and then it becomes so hard to shift. Um, you know, my organization, we were in the team's tap program. We were early adopters. So, um, you know, we kind of piloted the transition from from Skype to Teams, but it was very, you know, lines of business, you know, the sales team was very divided on, yep. you know, I don't want to switch to this new platform. Like it's too busy. People still complain about notifications. We've done so much kind of internal policy writing just to make sure that, um, you know, we lock down the, the sort of general team that everyone's in to some degree so that it's not overwhelming. Um, but there is, you know, there's always there's always preferences that come into play. Yeah, I think it's interesting you mentioned the Skype to Teams transition. Skype for Business was my favorite messenger tool at the time before persistent messaging was a thing. Mm. And I think it's because the, the user interface was, at the time, it was slick. It was easiest to use compared to all the, um, I'm going to label them traditional telecoms vendors that made a soft phone. Um I won't name drop any bad examples, but I used a lot that were just a little bit clunky. And if you compared them to Skype for Business, they had absolutely no chance of of winning in a in a procurement or anything like that because you would just log on, use it. You knew how to share your screen. You knew how to send a message. You knew how to send a file. It was all pretty obvious, and it just worked right. And when you when you relate that to the persistent messaging platforms today, they are because there's so much more functionality in them, they're completely different to the basic instant messenger tools. And I think for first time users of these tools, maybe if you haven't used a Slack or a Teams before, it is very overwhelming just to use those as a, as a new way of working if you're not used to it. Definitely, actually, um, you know, of course, Microsoft has some of their own resources as well. But, um, you know, when we were in this early program, I actually put together, um, you know, a deck. We had a company wide presentation. I have a sort of program for our own organization that I wrote just called um, Learning to Love Microsoft Teams. That was just walking people through um, the basics, you know, because there's, you know, there's there's the functionality of the app itself. And then there's the way there's the quirks with how your organization um, decides to use it. You know, when do you make a new Microsoft Teams? When do you create a new group or a new channel? There's a lot of more decision making that needs to happen at that level. Yeah, and I think if you don't if you don't govern it and you let people do what they like, create as many channels as they need, well, as they think they need to mm -hmm. uh, message you in the wrong place. And the same is true in Slack and WebEx and everything else. If you don't teach someone the not the right way or the wrong way because there's no right or wrong way to to use these platforms but i guess best practice is the right word if you don't educate people into best practices of using these kind of platforms it will become a complete free-for-all and you'll see all of the conversation will just be a big blur in front of your, your screen because no one's moved that specific topic to a thread and i've, I've been playing around with, with discord recently um which isn't a business tool, but I think a lot of people are using it in business because it's mm -hmm. had so much success in the consumer world, but they don't have threading functionality, which is bizarre to me. So when I was first using it only with one or two other people, if you don't check your screen for an hour, you've missed 
everything that has happened in your uh, the called servers on Discord. You've, you've you've missed the whole context. It's all gone. Whereas if each different topic in that blur of the screen was just split out into a thread or in a different channel, it'd be much easier to follow. Definitely. It's funny because team still kind of has that problem where um, people still, you know, it's kind of a UI issue. But if you, you know, if you don't reply to the thread and you just type in the main kind of message bar that's available to you, you won't reply in thread. So you can tell kind of the people who haven't gotten as used to that etiquette. Um, of course, everyone makes mistakes now and again, but um, there's still kind of that issue from a UI perspective. Yeah, yeah. I must have, uh, sorry, I must have a Teams is one of the most frustrating experiences of working. And, and I don't know why, in, in some senses, you, you mentioned Sky for Business being your favorite. I mean, I, I didn't like Sky for Business f- uh, for a number of reasons, and I still get um, uh, cold shivers when I have to do a Sky for Business call with some of our customers that are still using it. <laughs> There's that satellite ringtone when you're trying to join a call that, that just, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, chalkboard, um, nails and chalkboard. But at least at least some of the stuff that Skype did was actually really intuitive and, and you didn't have to spend too much time explaining to people how to use it and, and all that kind of stuff. But Teams, I mean, I can be at a call, even one this morning where I lost the screen share because it, it moved down to a little tile in the, in the right-hand corner but yeah. I couldn't because I couldn't see it because I had my notes open. So I'm trying to see what the person sharing is saying, but I can't find the thing. And I ended up having to exit the call to come back into the call because that was quicker than trying to find the tile. Yeah, um, I've done that. You know, <laughs> uh, and I see they finally are allowing you to see who's actually joined a call once you go over four people um, without having to go look at the participants. You'll have the sort of grid view you get with Zoom. But yeah, you can have up to nine now. It's three by three, isn't it? Yeah. I think there's there's a lot of – it's easy to bash teams if you don't spend all of your time in it. Sure. And I, I've, I've got a lot of uh, friends, former colleagues, acquaintances in the industry that are Microsoft resellers, they're Microsoft Teams MVPs, and they know mm-hmm. everything about everything there is to do with Teams. And if you talk to them in a – if you get full tunnel vision on Teams and don't consider anything else – because you use SharePoint and you use PowerPoint and Word and all of the Microsoft suite. If you just use that and you spend a good amount of time learning how to use it correctly, then Teams could take over the world. However, the reality is everybody uses something else. Mm. So that you'll always be flicking between Teams and like you said to Skype for business for customers that don't have Teams when you need a meeting. So you'll go back to that nice UI where it was very simple because there wasn't much functionality on Skype for business. And then you'll go to your email, which you you know and you love and you can't let go for whatever bizarre reason that is that is in your mind and everybody will never let go of email. And then you'll play around with something else because it's new and you'll think that's pretty good, but it's not quite what I'm used to. So we'll go back again and you'll come back to Teams but you'll have all these other things in your mind from those other apps that you've been using and you'll go, oh, why can't I just do this? Why can't I just do that? But if you were just fully focused on Teams for six months, you would think it's the best platform in the world. And I've uh, somehow found myself backing Teams up there. But I think if you, no, you, you're if, right, you go in, if you go all in on Teams, then it is a fantastic but, platform. But, but you, I mean, you, me and, and Heather, and, and I know some of Heather's work colleagues are – us, I don't want to say savvy people, but but you, you, you're you prepared to work with the tooling. So for me, Teams has become an easy one to use, and I'm quite comfortable with it. In fact, I, I've started to prefer it over Zoom. Um, but when I talk to people that are non-technical savvy, they they get frustrated because just to do a call feels complicated. Um, mm. I mean, the, the concept of channels, I mean, wow, that, took, that must have taken about six weeks of every day doing something in a channel to show why you'd use a channel um, subtly and, and, and indirectly as opposed to a normal front, you know, uh, in your face training exercise. Uh, for people to actually grasp what a, what a channel would do for them, um, you know, just working on a little project, for example, you know, use this channel for all communications about this project. Yeah, but why must I do that? Why don't I send an email? Because it's very hard to keep track of all the emails flying in your mail, in your, in your inbox. I think yeah. it's a it's a company size thing as well. I don't mm. see any use for Teams if you're in a company with, or maybe not maybe department size rather than company size. If your company's less than twenty people, you absolutely don't need Teams. If you're 
department is three people or less, then you shouldn't be using channels, I don't think. Um, and, and lots of people do because they have other channels as well, right? So the, the channels with three people in do exist, but they also have channels with 100 people in. Mm. I, I, I don't think that's the most productive way to work. And that's where, dare I say, instant messaging was better. If you if your sole purpose is just to chat point to point with somebody, either messaging or calling, that's that's where the older way of messaging is probably better. Well, for, well, you, for say, you say that, but persistent, I mean, if you take, like we, we do a lot of project work. So to have a, so we have a group that's set up for everyone and then we have channels per project. I finally got this part through. Now, when you work on that project, you try and communicate in that channel as much as possible. And specifically when it comes to, and this is where you're, the, the, the Microsoft ecosystem now begins to become very sensible and very powerful. Um, we record the, 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 the session, every call we, we have we record um, in Teams and that goes into stream and that link gets published into the channel. Um, documents are shared through the same place. So when we have people come and go, uh, and we have you know some some secondments and we have some contractors and that that come and go, they go look at that channel and everything is sort of there. I mean, yes, it's it's not the most easy thing to navigate, but they can at least start and, and go backwards and forwards and, and get a sense of what's been going on when they while they've been away, um, or if they're starting from fresh. There's some things that have been pinned that they can go look at, or there's a there's a, a tab to the wiki or to the files, um, and these are things that I've found really useful. Just having those tabs there um, gets people going a little bit quicker, um, and also takes off the cognitive load of someone else trying to get them up to speed and forwarding, trying to find the hundred emails that they, or, or sifting through the emails to try and find the documents that they need to look at, or you know here's the link to this. All those little things that that are painful usually. I think Teams is actually starting to make it a bit easier, but there's just UI things that need to be to be polished up. I think. Yeah, I think the exact same applies to things like Ring Central Glip and Cisco WebEx mm. Teams. They yeah. they all do exactly what you've just explained. Um, none of them are perfect. Mm. You, you have to spend some time up front installing everything so that your integrations are working all the time and your workflows actually flow rather than come to a, a stopping point. Yeah. As long, as long as you do it up front, then yeah. you could almost choose any platform, couldn't you? Um, it's, it's when you need to work more collaboratively with external people is when it becomes a bit of a problem. And that's where Heather wants her external phone number. <laughs> exactly because um, actually the thing I wanted to ask you about Dominique you, so you sent us a few links um, the one was the message report um, but the one that I thought was the most interesting was your your, your influences chart um, the sort of top 50 uh, and I wondered if this is something that you're now tracking more regularly to see who uh, is at the top versus I don't say at the bottom but, but in that top 50 and it was yeah. just, uh, I'm assuming you did this on followers as opposed to any other sort of metric. Yeah, so this this was based on Twitter followers. Um, mm. And this this was purely a, a marketing exercise internally at Mio to get our name out to the wider industry, I think. So our platform combinations that we support, uh, supported when we made it and still now as Microsoft Teams, Slack and WebEx Teams. Additionally, there are, hundreds more platforms out there right in the industry that, that we all know and a lot that we don't know um so this was put together to one expose the brand to these analysts and mvps and c-level uh, executives at, at these brands as well as uh kind of collaborate some kind of database for us to reach out to people to send send iterations of the product to for them to provide us with feedback on to see if a particular enterprise analyst thought our enterprise model was sufficient for what they were actually talking to customers and other brands about uh, but also to maybe this was a personal goal rather than a business goal but to drive some kind of competition into not having the most followers but for growing the uc industry as a whole because until until unified comms changed probably to team collaboration i didn't think it'd been marketed very well at all it was very very old-fashioned it was always these are the features that we support here's your instant messaging here's your telephony 
you can have a meeting if you pay a bit extra. That was marketing of unified comms until really very recently because nobody had spent any money on, on marketing. And I think that's because the majority of unified comms companies stemmed from the old fashioned telecoms sales way of working, which I guess originated in knocking on doors and asking if you needed a broadband upgrade or a phone line installed. And they didn't have the resource for online marketing, which is uh, the only way Mio works today. It's all it's all online marketing. 90% of it is, is through our blog. And it's completely different to when I first started uh, at 5G, back at the beginning of, uh, of this podcast. Yeah, I love this um, this infographic. I thought it was really smart, and um, I'm already like, how could I create my own for, you know, end user computing? Because I think you know it is it, it hits on you know sort of the micro influencer trend as well, and um, you know people obviously branding you know themselves you know in addition to their companies. So you know, super shareable and and interesting and um, just a great resource in general. Yeah, it was it was an absolute magnet for traffic as well because mm-hmm. forty five of the fifty people shared it on their social media across all of oh, their of social media. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was some search traffic for Unified Comms influencers, which is the name of the infographic. Um, anyway, I was looking for my own so that I could reach out to the right analysts just to just to do my job. And the only ones that I could find were out of date. I hadn't heard of any of the people. They didn't work in the Unified Comms industry anymore. So there was an actual need to refresh that kind of content. Um, I don't think anyone else has, has done anything with it. And I've kind of adopted Unified Comms influencers or UC influencers as my my side brand. That's the name of my podcast. I've got a website by the same name. And I think probably post Mio, which is something that our CEO Tom talks about quite a lot because we are a, a startup. The the ambition one day is to sell to another company when the time is right, uh, unless it completely is a requirement to serve standalone, which may or may not be the case, but he's a serial entrepreneur. He builds successful companies and, and that, that's how he makes money in that kind of model. Um, so he very often talks to all of us at Mio about what is next post Mio. And for me, I think it's maybe taking that brand and doing something with it, either in an analysis role, kind of as an industry commentator, or in what I do now, which is freelance marketing for companies that need help in the unified comms space, of which there are still quite a few. Yeah, I definitely, um, you know, I definitely see see a need for that kind of, um, you know, perspective and then having that organized out there is, is really interesting. And I think it hits on something that, um, you know, you tend to observe in the wild, you know, I follow all these people on Twitter and you can see them interacting with each other and you get a sense of, um, you know, who the, um, movers and shakers are in the space, but, um, yeah, kind of, you know, putting it down on paper or something else. Yeah. You meant, you mentioned the personal brand element as well. I think for me, as someone so heavily engaged in social media, so we say, um, I wouldn't buy from someone. If a salesperson approached me to buy their SaaS product, I probably wouldn't buy from them if they weren't on Twitter and I could actually see what they were talking about every day. If they weren't fully invested in their own product and their own industry, then that's that's a no for me. I know not everybody works that way, but there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of CEOs and one of the influencers, uh, two of the influencers on the infographic actually, Dave Michaels and Evan Castell, they they run their own podcast, which is uh, C level executives in the unified comms world or enterprise comms world rather. Um, their their question is uh, why aren't you on Twitter? If the mm. CEO of the company mm. is on Twitter, or if they're not talking to the CEO, might be the CFO or whatever, why isn't your CEO on Twitter? Which really spurred me the first time I listened to the podcast to go and find all of these CEOs that are on Twitter because they're more likely the, the real brand advocates that believe in the product and the industry, not necessarily just running a business. Uh, sorry. Good question. How did you decide about someone going on this list? Because, I mean, you've got the followers. That's one thing. But, I mean, how did you decide that, say, Elka Popova is a unified comms she puts out enough content that's unified comm specific. So there's, I guess there was my own criteria. It wasn't biased because I don't work with it. I was guessing I don't work with any of these people. I do work with two of them. Um, mm. 
do, would do I or would I follow them if I wanted to know more about unified comms? If you don't fit that underlying criteria, you're not getting on the list. Um, and then, is it useful? I guess is the next part of the flow chart, or are you just regurgitating content, or are you just spouting rubbish on Twitter as many people do? Um, <laughs> And then once once I had a list of useful people, of which I I think I got to 50, realized there were definitely more than 50, decided I needed to rank them by something, rather than going into some kind of scientific algorithm of posts times followers times engagement, which uh, I don't have the metrics for, frankly. Um, I, I thought the easiest way was to, to rank them by number of followers. That was kind of the fairest way. They if you have more followers, you are going to influence more people, which at the time felt right. Looking back on it, probably it was incorrect to do so. If you if you look at the amount of people that specific people on that list are actually following themselves, you can tell they've only grown their following by following 100,000 people, for example. Does that make them more of an influencer than someone with 500 followers if their engagement is a far superior ratio. It's a tough one. Well, I suppose, I mean, there's, there's, you've got to have a level of, of in, intuition. Um, yeah, it wasn't particularly scientific. No, I, I, don't, I don't think it can be. I mean, I was thinking about the cloud scores that was around for a while, um, which was an attempt at some sort of science for, for how strong as we influence. But that could be so easily swayed. Yeah, I think once once you include the follower count into anything, it kind of overrides everything, doesn't it? Because you could have mm. 250,000 followers, but follow just as many people, and they could have all muted you at the end of the day. So mm. unless, you're, unless you're plugged into a platform, paying for the money to receive all the metrics, you, you, can't, you can't really do a, a scientific uh, influencer list, I don't think. People like... The Financial Times do them, and they do spend the money and the time on it, I and mean, they have the resource to do it. But at the end of the day, it's uh, it was a marketing exercise for a startup, not a scientific experiment. So, mm -hmm. I'm, while, while I realise it was definitely flawed, I'm I don't lose any sleep over it. What are, What are your thoughts on on WhatsApp, and not necessarily integrating with WhatsApp only, but but becoming quite a it's not it's not just a consumer tool anymore. It's, it's part of business to an extent as well. My my personal experience with WhatsApp as a business tool is it's dreadful because and this might be a reflection on the brands rather than the technology mm. because the I think there's maybe four or five examples I could give that they've prompted me to use WhatsApp. Great, I use WhatsApp. I'd rather be on WhatsApp than SMS or hang around on their live chat on their website because I've got things to do. Mm. You get there. They send you a welcome message, you reply, you don't hear back from them because probably the demand for WhatsApp is still outranked by the demand on their live chat or their email or their mm. call center or whatever it is. And because it's so easy to delete a conversation on WhatsApp, it's gone, isn't it? So there was a digital marketing agency that reached out to me on WhatsApp because I entered my phone number. I thought, great, I spend a lot of time in WhatsApp anyway. I'll talk to them there. I cancelled my free trial via WhatsApp. They ignored the message. Therefore, it wasn't cancelled and I was charged for a year's subscription for something I wasn't going to be used. That was a terrible customer experience. That's then replicated across three, three or four more brands that I've given them the time of uh, using their WhatsApp for business and they just haven't responded. So I, I, I think the demand in other areas is still so much that nobody specifically focused on WhatsApp. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you, you bring up that that customer experience piece to it because that's that's almost one part of the, the puzzle. The other the other part is is internal work where instead of using something like Teams, team members are are, are sharing and, and collaborating via WhatsApp. Okay, they're not necessarily not necessarily sharing documents, but if there's a I'm going out now for a run, so I won't be online instead of setting their teams to out of office or away, they sent out a WhatsApp to the group saying, I'm going for a run. Yeah, this um, this this was alien to me until I asked uh, I asked on Twitter a few weeks ago, specifically to the marketing community, what do you use to 
chat with your clients. I was hoping they'd all say Slack and Microsoft Teams and WebEx Teams so I could write a nice blog post about it. But WhatsApp mm-hmm. was definitely the most popular answer for mm-hmm. internal and for external, mm-hmm. which I, I don't use it that way. And I think it might be a might be UK or European thing that this happens more so in WhatsApp. Um, SMS is still definitely big in the US for intercompany communications. I know my CEO talks to a lot of our customers via SMS, ironically. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever imagine a situation where I would talk to one of my customers over WhatsApp because we would be using Slack, Teams, WebEx, all these business tools, right? Yeah. But it does yeah. happen. I mean, uh, anecdotally, uh, I, I'm part of a forum and we were discussing how one of the banks is rolling out mobile phones again. They'd spent five years cutting back their mobile phone footprint um, or, or firm provider mobile phones because everyone is using their bring your own devices. Um, where they've had to now start running out firm managed devices again because of the because of WhatsApp being used and how the regulators were frowning on their activities because traders were talking to clients or whatever it was through WhatsApp and they and they weren't able to extract the content of those messages. Um, but they were legal legal tender anyway. Um, so you know agreements and contracts, for example, would be agreed over WhatsApp and then put it to a contract. And then they were disputing the contract because yeah. they had agreed in WhatsApp. Um, so almost to eradicate WhatsApp as a business tool for that for that business by controlling the device, you can't install WhatsApp. You have to use you know, let's say Teams over a federated link. I in, I interviewed Chad Reese, who's the director of IT for the Pro uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame. Oh, um, cool! It's in American football. He said exactly the same thing. Um, they moved from uh, Skype to Teams. But when they were halfway through rolling it out, nobody got through. No, nobody adopted Teams as well as they wanted to. And people started talking in, in WhatsApp groups, of which all the same problems you just mentioned. It's not regulated. They can't extract any information. The answer to that is maybe introduce a mobile phone that doesn't allow WhatsApp communications. Mm. But then my counter would be you still have a personal phone. You could still talk to them on WhatsApp anyway. Yeah, I was going to bring up a similar point because obviously, you know, what we're talking about here is is shadow IT. And I think, um, you know, the tendency tends to be, you know, lock it down, shut it down, take it away. But um, people find a way (laughs) if it's really their preferred way. Um, people find a way. I guess I'd, I'd be curious, Ryan, to get your perspective on, um, you know, shadow IT in general and, and how, how to handle that. What would you do if you're, you know? Well, if, it, it, yeah. it, it's funny because that's exactly the question that came up in the forum. So you're going to go give these guys all these devices so that they don't use, the, they don't use WhatsApp uh, on, the, on the work device, but they still use WhatsApp on their personal device and they still go and talk to the customer or, or investor that way. How are you going to handle it? And they said, it's, it's a, it's a, they don't know because it's a legal quagmire. No one knows how to, you can, you can put the person on the hook for having the conversation that they will sign a new agreement saying that they won't do that, but they still might have to do it because the customer contacts in that way. And it, you know, it gets into very awkward situations. I mean, shadow IT is, is definitely growing. Um, the, the amount of, of services that you can go buy on your credit card that that can be up and running quickly without the need of IT. Because uh, IT is usually seen as the slowest part of the process um, for good reason uh, and, and bad reason too. Uh, the good reason is usually around security and integration and supportability and, and those things. Um, but the other problem is that you don't normally have the resources in IT because it's, it's a cost center to do all that stuff quickly. So you end up being uh, at the back of the queue or, or looking at some sort of prioritization discussion um, within the business. Um, we ran into a few problems with that where customers would go and spend out of the, and, and in the end, IT is based on the business's budget anyway. So they just take their budget out of the IT pot in theory and go and buy the piece of software that they wanted. So a CRM tool or something that's that they needed. The problem is that they would go and buy this tool that sign a contract um, and then come bring in IT and then say, oh, but I need to make this work with all my other stuff. 
So now I've bought a, you know X Y Z CRM tool, which might have been someone's friend's son's uncle's um, garage project, um, but now it needs to integrate in with the the purchasing system so we can invoice the customer and and bill them for it. Well, your tool doesn't do any of those things, so now I need to spend a year, two years building all the things that that tool doesn't do. Whereas if we'd gone through a, a more normal process, you would have probably had an RFP out and got got a tool that was tried and tested and all the rest of it. So, so shadow IT is is a problem. It's a, it's got good things and bad things. I think it's good in the sense that it pushes IT to be more aware of what the business actually wants and and uh, more aligned to it. But it's bad because of all those things that that, that create more complexity in, in in an environment. I think I would just add that personal preference will always trump. IT dictatorship. Mm. <laughs> there will always be a way. Someone will always prefer something to whatever you roll out. It might be the best today. It doesn't mean it's going to be the best tomorrow. And I think fighting personal preference is probably the wrong way to go about governing your IT infrastructure. No, it's, it's funny. So, yeah, I mean, you and that's the whole end user experience thing uh, or adoption. Uh, as another way of looking at it is how do you get that dopamine hit for the th- for the tool that you're rolling out as opposed to that personal preference do- dopamine hit that that comes bu- comes about um, yeah I, I, I think that side of things is it's, it's it's funny but it's so relevant isn't it in in the consumer world we use Facebook Twitter Instagram snapchat TikTok the list goes on and why do you use them to share your content? No, for people to respond to your content, to say that they like it, to say that they mm. uh, love it. You can now applaud it. You can say something is inspirational. Ultimately, you want to comment and you want to share. The same is true of workplace tools, workplace communication devices, all of those, because the consumerization, consumerization of technology is embedded into what we do in in the workplace. You you want someone to say your work is good. Mm. Well, you're doing the right thing. You're, we, you're, we're trained to, to look for recognition. Uh, yeah, and, and that doesn't need to be in a quarterly quarterly review meeting, does it? It could mm. be emoji reaction on Slack or Teams. Yeah. Do you think that's why uh, generationally is the messaging is more taken up now than it has been in, in previous Generations. I mean, I, I grew up with Merck or IRC, and I mean that's no different to what we're using now in Teams, really, channels and all the rest of it. But it never made it to business. I don't think that's the reason. In knowledge workers, for people that work at a desk eight hours a day, and they work online with other people, I don't think that's the reason. No, I think the the reason why messaging is so popular in in my generation is because it's it's quicker mm. for us to message someone and continue doing whatever piece of work it is you're doing you could also send out a, a broadcast message to 10 people to get their opinion on something rather than calling those 10 people the the whole the whole notion of calling someone and them not answering the phone is bizarre i think because why why would you attempt that call if you know the, you know there's a 50-50 chance of them answering, you could send them a message and you know they're going to reply eventually. Mm. It, it removes the wait period. It may not be quicker to physically write a message than it is to call someone and ask them one question, but over the course of a week, the, the productivity gains outweigh the immediate losses of not getting that immediate response, I think. And I think that's why messaging is, is, is preferred. I know that I can send 100 messages in the morning get all of those replies overnight and carry on with my day. And I haven't wasted any time calling anybody and not getting hold of them or calling them and actually going off track, talking about something else because that's what you do. Right. Which sounds, yeah. sounds less personal, but if you're, if what you're doing is, uh, needs to be more transactional or more efficient, then why would you not go to that modal? Yeah. Which is why email was so popular for a long time as a, as a way of communicating because you could batch everything. You could get up early, send your, your 10, 20 emails in the morning. Yeah, they may not be lengthy ones, which is also good. 
but then look at your email again at lunchtime and you've got all the replies back to the stuff you asked for or then you have a call because you can see it, it's going to be quicker to have a call than to send another email and reply. Um, so I can definitely see where you're going with, with IM as, as the next evolution on that. I think if you e- if you manage your email in, in a good manner as well, and we've spoken about email behavior before, it's when you first Ooh. mentioned that I should read Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Working Week, which I then yeah. did. And he actually only checks his email uh, once a day and then it was once a week or whatever it, it eventually became. I think if you can be disciplined enough to do that, then it works really well. But the reality is people are too scared to take that step in case they miss something that nobody has done that. And that's why email still exists. So my, my May project will be, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to respond to anyone's email because I know that I don't need to, I don't, I don't need email personally. And I would like to drive that behavior in everyone that I interact with, whether or not it work, I don't know. I'm very curious to, to see how that goes because it's, it's an experiment I'd like to do as well, because I'm very, I'm, I'm, a big fan of using email, which has come against me a few times as a, as a, as a derogatory comment that I use email too much. <laughs> um, I'd be interested to know which experiments like. So I'd like to try that to see if maybe using other channels. So every email you get, you use a different channel to reply to that email on. So you phone them, you text them, whatever it is. Is that what you're going to do? Or do you think something well, else? That's, that's what I do anyway, realistically. Mm. Someone sends me an email and it could have been something else, I reply in that something else anyway. Um, I may be, it's, it's, it's tricky when it's external. I th- personally, I think there's no use for internal email anymore. When it's external, it's difficult if someone is not using a chat platform that integrates with each other, which is a real problem. If you're using Teams and you can have guest access, that's fine. If you're using Slack and you use shared channels, that's fine. But if someone's using a different platform, then your only option is to use an aggregator like uh, Mio or any of Mio's rivals. But then if you're using a platform outside of what is supported there, there really isn't much of an alternative. And that, that I think, will be the, the main uh, issue in my experiment in May, which you're welcome yeah. to join me in if you uh, if you want to do the same. <laughs> I, I'm very tempted. I would actually like to see. Uh, in fact, I think I will. Um, I'd like to do it for May with you, and let's let's discuss it at the end. Um, I probably want to put some thought into not necessarily tracking it, but think, but scenarios where there was just no other choice but to use email. Yeah, um, which in, in my mind, the goal is that there aren't any. Mm. Um, and might have to get creative for some, but I, I I think it's it's achievable. I know we need to wrap up for time here. Um, you know, if our audience wants to reach out to you, um, you know, where where are some good places to look? If you want to follow my email expedition, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'll be I'll be documenting it on Twitter. I'm at Dom Kent D O M K E N T. I am on LinkedIn as well, Dominic Kent, but. I would suggest you read my Medium post on sending me a LinkedIn request first, um, because I've I've recently documented those as well, kind of like what I'm doing with email. Um, I've had some horrendous LinkedIn requests, uh, so I've documented them all, and I'm desperately trying to find what that was called. It was something called the worst LinkedIn requests, and I think you'll mm-hmm. find the one on Google if you do find it. So. If you do want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I am Dominic Kent, but please send me something a little bit authentic and I'll accept. All right. Well, thanks for joining. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. It's been a long go. Much better, well, much lengthier conversation I thought it was going to be, so this has been really good. And, uh, yeah, I think I'll take you up on that. I don't want to say it's a challenge, but, I, but I'll join you on the, uh, on the adventure of reducing to no, to no email. Yeah, let's do it. Super. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. And we'll talk soon. Thanks. Nice chatting. Cheers, folks. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, If you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.